Now here is Victor Borger. From the majestic Fox Theater, we proudly present Victor Borga, then and now. Chinese food. For the ones of you who are not familiar with me, my name is Victor Bo for, for the ones who come in late also, or whatever. <laughs> my name is Victor Borger, and I, I'm 68 years old, but I'm not the least embarrassed about it because I was born 83 years ago. <laughs> and, My background is very simple. I was born at home, and uh, <laughs> when my mother saw me, she was taken to the hospital. <laughs> they told me a little thing about a few things about my my great grandfather, for instance. Yeah, they traced him back to Marie Antoinette. As a matter of fact, my great-grandmother traced him back there a couple of times. <laughs> yeah. He had... We, li we lived in the same house as they did. Everybody in Denmark lived in houses, because once they get out of the houses, they're in Sweden already. <laughs> but uh, he had four sons. I'm still talking about my great-grandfather. Would you be kind enough to laugh for the rest of the audience? <laughs> he had four sons, one of which, they say, went a little nutty, <laughs> because they say because he didn't get the woman he loved, but that's not so, because his brother went just as crazy, <laughs> and he got her. <laughs> so, I mean, this is just a story. Yeah. My grandfather was, uh, I don't know if you're interested in it, but my grandfather, would you rather see a movie? <laughs> my grandfather was kind of, he was very nice, he was a very big man. I used to sit in some of his laps, and he was a kind of an inventor, an amateur. He invented, for instance, the burglar alarm, which unfortunately was stolen from him because... <laughs> But they were very musically inclined, they hated music, and uh, <laughs> I'm told that my grandfather, there were sometimes for weeks he didn't speak to his wife, because he didn't want to interrupt her. <laughs> so, he also, he made a potato pancake kind, it, it was a, he, he crossed an Idaho potato with a, a rubber sponge, one of these sponges that grow in water, you know. It's terrible. It tasted, oh, it tasted absolutely terrible. But it held a lot of gravy. <laughs> now, this was part of my childhood. We lived on that for a while, and that was... Yeah. <laughs> He also invented a soft drink, which he called 4-Up. <laughs> I 
that it wasn't any good. <laughs> he improved it, he thought, and called it fiber. Still no good. <laughs> so he tried once more. And what do you think he called it? Six up, of course. <laughs> Nobody still liked it. So there was, it didn't matter anyway. He died heartbroken right after anyway. <laughs> Little did he know how close he came though. <laughs> I was born, as I told you, at home. And my, my father was a musician and my, my mother played piano. And, uh, <clears throat> Once in a while, they played together. <laughs> Obviously, but because they were both, they, they both liked music, you know. I gave my first concert at eight, a few minutes after eight, because we never started on time, as a matter of raining pretty heavily that night, anyway. I remember the day, I think it was a Monday, I remember it clearly. No, it wasn't too big. <laughs> well, one of those days. And uh, in the afternoon, it was a cold winter day. Did I say it was raining? It wasn't. It was snowing. No, it was. There was a day after it was raining. And uh, my father came home and found me in the living room at home in front of a roaring fire, which made him very angry. Yeah, we, we didn't have a fireplace. <laughs> and. Uh, never forget that. He stood there, he pointed at me, he said, Borger? He could never remember my first name. <laughs> he said, shame on you, he said, when I was your age, I was 12. As a matter of fact, <laughs> this was not what I wanted to tell you. <laughs> yeah, he couldn't remember my name. I was the only son, you know. <laughs> Later on, I had an older brother, but that was a... Uh, uh, <laughs> Throughout the evening, I'll share with you some of the clips from shows I have been doing on television and uh, even the old movies. I hope you will enjoy them. Once I was left alone on a stage with a baby, and believe me, it, it wasn't easy. <laughs> now, wait a minute, don't choke before you get the milk. Wait a minute. There it is. Whoa, that's all right. <laughs> ah, that's good. Thank you. <laughs> Here's another one. Ah, go a little bit. <laughs> Cute little baby, isn't it? Cute little baby elephant. Well, I think that did it. Huh? Ah, well, maybe I... I've got a pay of it. Ah. A man came over to me, he must be in his 90s, about 96 or 97 years old. He used to be my father's barber. His name is Schwartz, and I hadn't seen him for 50, 60 years. But he recognized me, he came over, he said, Victor, was it you or your brother who died? I told him that was one of the things I just couldn't remember. <laughs> yeah. He, <laughs> my father told me about him. I remember I went to his shop once. He was a barber. He cut hair and so on. And once I said to him, I must have been about 15 or 16. I said, Mr. Schwartz, when you cut my hair, will you make it shorter on one side and then make a couple of holes on top? 
right in the middle if you wish, and in the back just make a zigzag. <laughs> I would like that. He said, Victor, you know I can't do that. So I said, Mr. Schwartz, you did it last time. But I don't know, it's always when I'm playing something, you know, I, I, my, my, my thoughts wander and, who's that? Oh, oh. They wander and wander and wander. Once I was playing, it was a concerto, a Chopin concerto. And in the middle of it, I'm playing very nicely and the orchestra is going bang, bang, bang. And all of a sudden, a fly is walking from here to there, turning back to there again. And I'm sitting there playing and watching this fly go. <laughs> and the musicians are going like this and, boom, and all that. And all of a sudden, it dawned on me, how does that fly land on the ceiling? <laughs> right in the middle of the concerto. Does it go like this and turn and get up like this? <laughs> Those are things that go through my mind. This is terrible. It's and how does it get off again? <laughs> like that? And there are people are sitting listening. Oh, how lovely he played there. With that damn fly is hanging up there. I guess it is. And that's what I meant to say about Mr. Schwartz. <laughs> My father said that Mrs. Schwartz and Mr. Schwartz were not very good friends. <laughs> they hated each other, as a matter of fact, because there were always some trouble between them in the barber shop. She worked there also. And uh, so when he asked me that stupid question, I didn't know what to say except, <laughs> how is Mrs. Schwartz? He said, oh, she's fine. He said, but I wish I had shot her when I wanted to. <laughs> because I would have been out by now. <laughs> that was Mr. Schwartz. <laughs> yeah. he, was, he was also, I should be forgetting into all this. This is maybe too late for that, but anyway. <laughs> Ladies, better than never. So, um, one Sunday afternoon, we were standing, my parents and I, we were standing at the railroad station in front of a ticket office, and we were going out to the country, and in front of us was Mr. Schwartz, which we didn't know until he spoke, then we recognized his voice. And he didn't know we were behind him. We heard him say, I'd like to have a round trip ticket. And the man behind the counter said, to where? And the man said, to here, of course. <laughs>
I was happy when Fuzzy the Bear called me from London and asked me to participate in a Muppet show there. And I was very surprised when I found that Beethoven was also on the show. Wow. Oh, Mr. Boyer. Could, could I come in and hear you play? Yes, come right in. Come oh, in. terrific! Be quiet. Yeah. Oh, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy. I'll be real quiet. What are you going to play? I'm going to play some Beethoven. I'm playing the Moonlight Sonata by Beethoven. Oh, go ahead, yes. Uh, I don't think you would like it. Why? See what it says here, con molto tedioso. What does that mean? That means with great dullness. I don't think you would like that. Not the way you came in here. Yeah, that's a... No, go, bad. please, please, for me. Okay, you have to be quiet. Okay, shh. <laughs> that's the Spanish composer. El Beethoven. <laughs> oh. You made a mistake. No, that's the way I wrote it. <laughs> fascinating. Well, you can come back later and watch me tie my shoes. <laughs> uh, last, wait, not this winter, last winter, Queen of Denmark, the Queen of Denmark, Queen Margaret II, came to the United States on a state visit. I happened to be in Australia at that time. I was invited because I was going to do something at the White House to, uh, during the, or after the dinner, but I couldn't because I was in Australia. <laughs> yeah. And uh, the day after the dinner at the White House, the Queen went to Virginia on a helicopter flight. Unfortunately, they had a mishap and uh, the emergency landed and got another helicopter and everything went well. I was in Australia and as you know when it's Monday in Australia, nobody knows what day it is anywhere else. <laughs> but when I came back to New York, because there was another dinner for the Queen, she eats a lot. <laughs> and that was at a hotel in New York, which I was to attend. I told the Queen that I had read about his, her incident there with the helicopter a day before it happened. And she was very excited about that. She asked me why I hadn't told her. <laughs> so that, I didn't know you then. <laughs> no, I didn't have her number. And uh, at that, after that dinner, I played a little medley of Danish, some old Danish folk songs for some of the old Danish folks. <laughs> As a matter of fact, when I flew from New Zealand to Australia, it was one of these four engine planes and we flew in the evening and the plane was fully uh, loaded with people and we lost an engine right between the two countries and the captain said there was nothing to worry about, just take it easy, we have slowed down a little but we may be about 45 minutes late but don't worry about it, nothing happened so nobody worried about it, he thought. Then about 10 minutes later, another engine failed. And again, the captain came back and said, don't you worry, we have two engines still, and we are doing very well. We have lost a little altitude, but don't worry, we will be in maybe an hour and a half late, but we are doing very well. And everybody got up and started dancing, and that was nothing. 
except the lady behind me. She said, I hope the other two engines are all right, otherwise we may stay up here all night. tell you earlier, I was driving yesterday afternoon in a car and I stopped at a, a stop, what do you call it, a, a traffic light. And the other car pulled up next to me, a lady, a very beautiful lady, opened her window, she rolled it down and looked at me and signaled that I should do the same thing. So I lowered my window and she leaned out, she was very attractive. And she said, sir, would you happen to have some grey poupon? <laughs> I said, unfortunately, I'm just out of it. <laughs> but I have three other kinds. I always carry a lot of mustard with me in case of war. <laughs> ah, she was quite disappointed. <laughs> and I come think of, last time I was in Detroit, and I'm waiting for this opportunity to tell you that I was down here near, near the, the, the river. There was a bench under a piece of grass, a, there were three men sitting on it, one in the center, of course. <laughs> and the man at that end did this. And on the other end, the man did this. And the man in the middle didn't do anything. He didn't do anything, and I watched it for a couple of minutes, and I thought they were maybe doing a movie or television show, or what have you. So I left, and a half hour later, I came back. They were still doing the same thing. And I watched for a couple of minutes, and I finally went over to the man in the middle, and I said, excuse me. I don't want to interrupt, but whatever you're doing, there are no fish here, you're sitting on the lawn. And he said, oh. <laughs> so amazing. People are coming. Also, I used to play here in Detroit for many, many years, started in the, in the mid-40s at the Statler Hotel, if any remember. Yes, you remember that? I don't. <laughs> I thought it was so funny that they had, in the, in the shower rooms, they had uh, shower beds, they said, please place curtain inside top. They did that in those days all the time. I thought it was kind of strange. I had just arrived and I had to put the curtains inside the top. I thought they could do that themselves. I mean, they had, they had uh, housekeeping service and all that. But I remember I did it once. It took, took me about 28 minutes to get the curtains off those little hooks. <laughs> and they never told you which curtains they wanted in there, so I took every curtain off and pulled it. They don't do things like that anymore, I don't think that's very impractical. <laughs> and I came to Detroit Thursday, and as I waited for my baggage at the, at the airport, an elderly couple came by and the gentleman said, I wish I had brought my piano. <laughs> and I thought he had seen me and was trying to make a joke, but he hadn't, and he certainly wasn't. <laughs> The lady who accompanied him said, why should you have brought your piano to the airport? And the man said, because the tickets are on it. <laughs> In working with singing, there is occasionally a need to improvise. Sometimes it works, and sometimes... What's your name? Sergio Franchi. I have one big wish. And since, as I said, it is informed to show we can do almost anything that is <laughs> in, within decency. Um, may I accompany you to one song? 
you play for me? I love to. What would you like to sing in this case? Uh, it's now or never. It's what? It's now or never. It's now or never. It's now or never. Right. It's now or never. Right. <laughs> oh, um, I need a, a, a page turner. Would you please bring? <clears throat> I don't care what you look like. Just. <laughs> you again, huh? <laughs> Seems that we are. Uh, all you do is turn when I not. When when I do not not don't turn. <laughs> Understand? It's now never. Yeah, it sure is. I got never here. Where's now? <laughs> it won't be now if you don't get ever. <laughs> there it is. Can you read? <clears throat> All right. <laughs> ah. Look at this. This doesn't say. Piano, piano. Hey. Pronto, pronto. Take it easy, I mean. Pronto, Maestro? Yeah, pronto. Mm. Give, me, give me the note, please. The what? Note. Which one? Uh, uh, F. Get an F. Put it there. language I have invented, which I call the inflationary language. <laughs> Everything with numbers in it is going up and up and up, except the language. I have to explain it this way, that we will add one to each number in every word that contains a number. For instance, one, uh, number one in wonderful will be two-daful, because we add one to it. <laughs> Four will be five. Three eight will be three nine. <laughs> Tennis will be eleven. <laughs> a sentence like I ate a tenderloin with my fork will be a nine and eleven loin with my five. <laughs> I'm going to read to you from a book, just a short chapter, not a chapter, but a 
paragraph. This is a book written by a Russian author. Russian author. It's not a very good book, but I don't read the whole thing anyway. He is Ivanovich Falofov Sonovovich. Sonovovich. These are short. These are short stories. Very short stories. The shortest stories that is a, that are available actually, because they are so bad that there was no reason to make them any longer. <laughs> yeah. And he writes. Here, for instance, is one about Tchaikovsky. See under T. <laughs> are you laying eggs? <laughs> See under yeah. Peter Ilyich Tchaikovsky. It says seafood. What? Oh, seafood note. <laughs> Peter was born in Watkinsk, but never played down in the streets of Watkinsk like the other little children of Watkinsk, because when he was two months old, his parents moved to St. Petersburg. <laughs> That's the kind of stories he is writing. <laughs> now I'm going to find the one I'm going to read to you. Twice upon a time, <laughs> there lived in sunny California a young man named Bob. He was a little revenant in the air fives. Bob had been very fond of Anna, his one and a half sister, <laughs> ever since he saw the light of day for the second time. <laughs> they were proud of the fact that two of the five fathers were among the Crenindos of the U.S. Constitution. <laughs> now they were dining on the terrace. Anna, said Bob as he took a bite of marinated herring. You look beautiful, three night. <laughs> you never look so lovely, B5. <laughs> Anna really looked beautiful in spite of the illness from which she had not yet recuperated. <laughs> yes, repeated Bob, you look beautiful. <laughs> but you have three of the saddest eyes I have ever seen. The table was tastefully decorated with Anna's favorite flowers, three lips. <laughs> they were talking about Anna's as a ten husband. <laughs> That's a difficult one. As a ten husband. You got it? <laughs> From whom he was separated. <laughs> they were talking about Anna's acetine husband from whom she was separated. While on the radio, an Irish Elevener was singing T53. <laughs> I didn't get that one. <laughs> it was midnight, a clock in the distance struck 13. And suddenly, there in the moonlight stood her husband, Don Too. Obviously intoxic minded. <laughs> Having just had two, three many. <laughs> Anna, he blurted, You are no longer my two and only. <laughs> but Bob jumped to his feet. Get out of here, you three faced triple crosser. <laughs> and Anna warned, Be careful, Bob, you are talking to an officer. Aha, said Bob, is he two? I'm two, three. <laughs> well, I'll wait, I'll wait, I'll wait. <laughs> All right, said Don Two as he wiped his five head. <laughs> Farewell, Anna, five ever and ever. 
three to loo, three to loo. <laughs> Here I am now, and there I am then. There I am then. Strange language, isn't it? This is one of the most difficult waltzes Chopin ever wrote, and I never learned it. play the uh, Danish folk songs. I hope you will enjoy that.
One of my favorite clips was in a sketch when I played the famous composer of France, Liszt, uh, with uh, Mike Wallace as my straight man. Good evening. Tonight, we take pride in demonstrating for the first time the phenomenal discovery of the time window. The time window was developed by an obscure network vice president who was dozing one night before his television set and inadvertently short-circuited his remote control switch by dropping it into a plate of 100-year-old turtle soup. And to his amazement, this gentleman found himself watching a Civil War movie with the original cast, an event that occurred exactly 100 years ago. Well, tonight, through the miracle of the time window, we present the first in our new gallery of television portraits of colorful geniuses and historic figures of a century ago. And now, ladies and gentlemen, as you gaze into the time window, we take you to the home of the eminent Hungarian composer Franz Liszt. And in so doing, we set television back 100 years. <laughs> are you there, Mr. Liszt? Mr. Liszt, are you there? I certainly are, Mr. Wallace. <laughs> and how are you, Mr. Wallace? I'm fine, thank you. And how do you feel, Mr. Lee? Oh, I feel wonderful because Anderson doesn't upset my stomach. <laughs> We've been admiring your splendid home, all the stately chambers, mammoth furnishings, and I was most impressed with your beautiful formal garden. I noticed the geraniums coming up the front walk. Are those darn geraniums coming up the front walk again? <laughs> Could you please tell us just a little bit about your exquisite home? For instance, the interesting pictures on the wall over there. Oh, yes, I'm glad you asked that, Mr. Wallace. This is what I call my composer's corner. These are the composers of my most favorite uh, compositions, I may say. There I am, six years old. <laughs> Here I am, ten years from now. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. List, is, uh, is that a piece of music you have framed there on the wall? No, that is a piece of music I have framed there on the wall. <laughs> uh, this happens to be my first composition. <laughs> yeah. uh, it is not a very impressive composition, but it is a very important composition. May I play it for you, Mr. Please, Wallace? Please. I told you it was not very impressive, but it is important. Here it is. Yeah. Well, I told you. But it is very important because if we hadn't written this, we would never have had this. <laughs> uh, I understand. <laughs> Mr. Liz, while you have uh, conquered the world with your pianism, to say nothing of your composing, to whom do you feel that you owe all your success? My mother. <laughs> she was a very, very lovely woman. Even her name was lovely. Christmas was her name. <laughs> Christmas list. <laughs> With your permission, sir, I, I wonder if I may change the subject. Everyone is interested in the, uh, in the amours of a great artist. Oh. It's common knowledge that you have known many women in your lifetime. Now, Without going into details, of course, would you care to comment on your relationship with the fair sex? <laughs> Mr. Waters, <laughs> which, which one is that? <laughs> the fair, the women you mean? Yeah. <laughs> I had, a, I had a, intended to play something. My time is up. Oh, upside down, sorry. <laughs> My grandfather gave me this watch a few minutes before he died for 20 bucks. <laughs> it's one of these strange watches. <laughs> it's one of these self-winding watches. You remember? Some of you remember. They were 
what, 20 years ago, everybody had self-winding watches. This is one of them. You have to shake it once every half hour. <laughs> night and day. And if in the middle of the night you want to know what year it is, just look at the watch. Yeah, well, doesn't seem to impress you, but it works. It's good. <laughs> one problem with this watch, particularly, is that one hand is missing. <laughs> it's funny, but no, we don't know which hand it is because there's only one hand on it, and we don't know whether that's the little one or the big one. <laughs> That's why today is Monday, the 94th of November, 1612 BC. There's never been this much off. <laughs> Must have forgotten a couple of shakes. <laughs> Last Wednesday, my neighbor came in and distributed Christmas gifts. He also has one of these watches. <laughs> And he has the other hand. Every musician wants to encourage promising talent. And here was my first attempt. Ladies and gentlemen, last show I did, I introduced a prodigy. It's my pleasure again to introduce a prodigy in this show. Mr. Jimmy Mahoney, one of my pupils. Mr. What are you playing, Jimmy? Play the beautiful Blue Daniel. The beautiful Blue Daniel. As you wish.
you a favorite clip of mine. I celebrated my 80s birthday with a number of concerts in Europe. This one in Stockholm. One of my guests was the eminent violin virtuoso and good friend Anton Contra. Here, the rousing reactions from the audience afterwards called for an encore, which actually had not been planned. With no time to lose, Mr. Contra thought we should stay in the gypsy mood and ask if I was familiar with the Charters by Monty. I was, but had never played it. So, spontaneously, I improvised my way through it. Is that all? And here is how. another one where I was a piano tuner and here is a clip of my duty in that particular store.
At this point, I'm going to introduce the two people in the audience who really deserve introduction. And first of all, I'd like to introduce the man who has arranged or the, the, the sound system here for this uh, so-called broadcast. He's one of the finest engineers in the country. George, will you please stand up? He, sound is his specialty. Will you please stand up, George? George? <laughs> George! <laughs> he probably doesn't hear so well. <laughs> The next one I'm going to introduce, I hope can hear better. <laughs> it is an old friend of mine. We have studied together, we have played together, we have done concerts together. We, we, we have, for many, many years. And I know he's in the audience because he had a concert. He had a concert here in Detroit in the afternoon and said he would come over here. How did it go? Okay, yeah. It went it well. better than I thought it might. It really went very well. Yeah. I have known this man for how many years? Oh, close to 30. Close to 30 years. Yeah. A little more. Maybe. Would you please welcome... What's your name? <laughs> <laughs> Leonid Ham. Oh, Leonid Hambro, of course. That's what it is. Well, as you can see, Lee, we don't, we don't have much time really, so therefore we have decided that you will play 30 seconds and I will play 30 seconds. That way we together can play the middle walls. <laughs> <laughs> Be my guest. Have a seat or two. Okay, ready? Ready? Shoot!
like to add that Leonid Hambro, as I said earlier, is a great pianist, and now is traveling all over the world very successfully concertizing with what he called the Hambro Quartet of Pianos. And I wish him all the luck in the world, which he already has. Thank you, Lee. Tivoli Garden in Copenhagen in Denmark is one of the great show places in the world. A few years ago I went back to Copenhagen to visit some of my family and everybody was surprised that they all look very much alike. I wonder if you think so also. Take a look.
has often been asked to play his number all the way straight through. Well, that means, I don't know, straight through all the way or something like that. We have now chosen to play the 18th variation by Rachmaninoff of a theme by Paganini. And we hope you will like it. It's one of the most beautiful things ever written for piano and orchestra. And here it is. Twelve years I was concertizing, and during that time I often had an opportunity to play an encore, which I generally did early in the evening. My favorite encores were the six waltzes, six lovely Viennese waltzes by uh, a great pianist by the name of Ignaz Friedman. I had intended and will play uh, uh, at least one of those six waltzes, the one I know, of course. And, uh, I hope you will enjoy it. As a matter of fact, I'm not going to play the one I intended to play. I'm going to play another one of the six, but you won't notice the difference. <laughs> Peter and the wolf. Nah, that's Strauss. <laughs> 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 
I know it ends here. I know some of you are expecting me to fall off or slide off the seat here, but I don't do that anymore because I hurt my shoulder doing it. Yeah, those days are over. I don't know that one.
share with you a bit from my early career. I shall now play another one with which I'm not too familiar. <laughs> then I shall play one I don't know at all. <laughs> and that will be followed by excerpts. <laughs> In this particular case, excerpts from Rachmaninoff's second piano concerto. Number two, that is. <laughs> by Rachmaninoff. <laughs> Sergeant Rachmaninoff. <laughs> He also wrote the music for this particular mess. <laughs> this is a piano concerto for piano and concerto. And it was written in four flats because he had to move three times. <laughs> and I play excerpts for two reasons. One reason is that I do not know the whole thing. <laughs> that happens to be the other reason also. <laughs> My mother made some of the finest excerpts that you have never tasted. <laughs> All kinds of excerpts, hard boiled, soft boiled, <laughs> ham and excerpts, bacon and excerpts, poached, scrambled, deviled, fried, and eggnog excerpts. <laughs> Particularly at Xmas time. Every Xmas Eve, my mother would make eggnog excerpts. In fact, my mother made the finest eggnog excerpts east of the Mississippi River and west of the Mississippi River. Because my mother made him in Denmark, so what difference does it make? <laughs> you see, my mother never came to the United States. My mother didn't even speak English. <laughs> in fact, my mother didn't even know anybody who spoke English. That's probably the reason why my mother didn't speak English, because had my mother spoken English, with whom should she have spoken English? <laughs> That's why my mother stayed home in Denmark and made eggnog soups. <laughs> Maybe she spoke English and nobody knew it. <laughs> this concerto by Rachmaninoff was originally written for a large symphony orchestra of approximately 95 pieces. But due to circumstances beyond my control, we seem to be a substantial number short. <laughs> but you might not notice the difference because we played very fast. <laughs> uh, Mine enough second piano concerto. Easter excerpts, those were the ones I could do. <laughs> Although Lawrence Melchior was one of the world's great opera stars, he has always been willing to have a little bit of fun. Thank you, Mr. Vedder. I'm, I'm extremely sorry. I have only that one orchestration, so I could not sing an hour because my accompanist, you know, he's still in Europe. And, oh, that yeah. is just too bad. Yes, now, yes. ladies and gentlemen, we have to go on with the show. Uh, well, 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 of course, I would like I would like to sing an encore. Uh, oh, sure, yeah, because, yeah. Uh, well, ah. you know, uh, if, 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 well, uh, if, um, if you could, if you could uh, perhaps, uh, I, 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 I have no accompanist, but you could perhaps, uh, if you would... Well, I don't sing, you know, that's it, that's uh, I'm, I'm off. Well, I mean, I mean, if you would... Uh, oh, uh, if I would, yeah, but I don't, yeah. I don't think the audience wants another one, actually. Right? <laughs> Must be a lot of people here from Toledo, <laughs> that's all I can say. Okay, Lars, if you want me to, let's step to the piano. Thank you. After Thank you, sir. Now it's, you know, I haven't accompanied anybody for years. Well, now I'm a soloist myself, you know, I, uh, <laughs> oh. Well, I shall try. I, uh, would like to know what are you going to sing? Uh, come back to Sorrento. Thank you. Anyway. <laughs> Must have been somebody who haven't heard it before. Flowers, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, when I used to be an accompanist, that I had three kinds of accompaniment. Yeah. One, yeah. I charged $200. That was excellent. That was brilliant. Of course, you could hardly hear the singer in that one. <laughs> and I had one for about, I would say, $150. That wasn't so hot, you mm -hmm. know. <laughs> you know, what can you do with one hand after all? It's, it's, it's... <laughs> then I had one for $100. For that one, I... Oh, I know, I know that one. And I, that, I, you know. I know that one, yeah. Which one do you wish? Oh, I, I leave it up to you, uh, what you think. Okay. <laughs> Won't cost you much tonight. <laughs> okay, may I hear your A, please? 
Oh, oh, oh. I like mine better. <laughs> well, but there's something in the piano that's not supposed to be. Yeah, that must be from another show. Would you please take that one? Sorrento? Hmm. <laughs> that's right. I'm sorry. Yeah. I don't intend hmm. now. Guarda il mare come bello, spira tanto sentimento, come tu soave cento, e me questo fa sognar. Signor Taranti, un profumo non va uguale, per chi va al pita d'amor. E tu dici il posto a Dio, allontani da Forza ti lasciar. Non mi poter, non darmi più tormento, torna tormento. Non darmi morire. Hands off, please. <laughs> she has a habit. You shouldn't lean against the pianos, Marilyn, because sometimes there might not be a pina pinano, a piano next to you when, when you sing. Maybe a flute player. You can't hang on to the flute. <laughs> you, know, you can't flout the flute. Yeah. Marilyn, instead of wearing 
actually today she's celebrating her second wedding anniversary. Is that true? Yeah. That's really an anniversary. How long were you married? <laughs> oh, two years. Yes, that's, I, I see. That's what it is, yeah. That's the second anyway. <laughs> Hands off, please. <laughs> what have you chosen to sing for us this evening? I'd like to sing the Caro Nome from Rigoletto. Oh, God. <laughs> All right, for the ones of you who are staying, <laughs> Marilyn will sing the Kagame, the what? The Kaganomi. Kaganomi aria from the opera Rico Mortis. <laughs> by, by all means. <laughs> who wrote that, Marilyn? Uh, Giuseppe Verdi. Why? I mean, why yes? Why yes? Giuseppe <laughs> Verdi. Joe Green to you. <laughs> Hands up, please. It should take long. Not if I can help it. What's the matter? Don't you know it? <laughs> oh, one more. It's mine. mine. Sorry.
have an agreement. She doesn't touch my piano. I don't lay hands on her coloratura. <laughs> Sit there. Twice. <laughs> I thought you had that fixed. <laughs> I was in heaven, on the visit, of course. And there I met some of the old masters, and one stepped forward, and he was a former Scandinavian. I could hear the way he spoke, because he had a problem pronouncing TH, particularly when they were close together. And I know how he felt, because I had the same problem when I came to the United States. It's very difficult to pronounce when you are not brought up in an English-speaking country <laughs> to pronounce TH. You have to stick out your tongue <laughs> like this. <laughs> and one never know how far to go. <laughs> <you know. laughs> in Denmark, where I grew up, we speak way back, way back here. The <laughs> but it's just a small country and we don't have much room to fool around in. And it is pretty cold over there in the winter time. And we don't stick out anything unless we are certain to get it back in again. <laughs> but anyway, in my dream, I saw him step forward and he said, you, we know you are going to play tomorrow afternoon in Detroit. And there must be somebody in the audience who, who is celebrating their birthday. Is he right or was he right in my dream? It's a, see what I mean? Yeah, you are right. I mean, yeah. You are right. He said, we have written some music so we can honor the celebrants. And here is the Brahms Waltz <laughs> by uh, uh, he couldn't remember that.
then I met Mozart. You know Mozart, as I told you. Yeah. This is his contribution. The ones of you who have heard it before may enjoy hearing it again. And the ones of you who have not heard it before may enjoy hearing it again next time. <laughs> and speaking of the phonetic punctuation. <laughs> oh. Well, I invented it many years ago when I first noticed that people who speak together often fail to understand each other clearly. Now, when we read or write, we use punctuation marks in order to underline the meaning of our sentences, but we do not have that support when we speak. So why not integrate punctuation marks into our speech? Then we can underline what we intend to convey to each other verbally. Now, what the hell was all that? <laughs> I always get involved in all these speeches and things like that. And of course, you know, you know, and then of course, and that is it was right. I'll teach you how to use the system. It's very simple. A period sounds like this. That was a bad one. That was a much better one. A dash. An exclamation point is a vertical dash with a period underneath. <laughs> See? The comma. Quotation are two commas. Or if you happen to be left-handed. Question mark is a little difficult. <laughs> Finally, the colon, the two little dots. You can put them over each other, or you can put them under each other, or you can put them wherever you want to put them. That's it. I have a short story right here in the beginning of the book. It's coming up. Page nine. Oh. Page six. In the open window there suddenly came light. Beautiful Eleanor sat alone dreaming of but one thing. <laughs> Two years had passed since she met Sir Henry. <laughs> she could still remember the unhappy evening when her father had thrown him out. They had been sitting in the park and Henry had said, darling, Is this the first time you have loved the <laughs> She had answered, yes. <laughs> but it is so wonderful that I hope it shall not be the last. <laughs> it's getting a little messy here, but otherwise. Would you like to move back one, one row? <laughs> Suddenly she heard a well-known sound. It was he. 
In two strides he was near her, embraced, kissed and caressed her. <laughs> Henry! <laughs> what is love? <laughs> she asked. He answered, well, I couldn't live without <laughs> She asked, I'm sorry, she was a little left-handed, where have your thoughts been? And he answered, with thee, my maiden. <laughs> Suddenly he had gone. Heard, heard. <laughs> All she heard was the well-known sound of his departing horse.